All right, guys, we've got probably the most requested video uh, on the channel right now. That is to do an analysis on Carnival Corporation stock, ticker symbol CCL. And this is a crazy stock right now, super volatile. In just the past few days, the stock has soared by over 40%. And yet year to date, it's still down over 75%. That's pretty crazy to think about. Now, before we start, I just got to say this. Of course, this is an incredibly volatile stock right now. The stock market in general is incredibly volatile. And the last few days have been crazy. The market has been roaring up. In my opinion, I think a lot of good news is kind of being priced in right now. I could see some downside to a lot of things that are going on right now. But just with this stock in particular, this is incredibly volatile, very risky, highly speculative stock. So please, as always, guys, do your own research and make your own decisions. I'm only sharing my opinion on the stock and letting you know uh, what I'm personally doing myself. Okay, having said that, this is clearly a video that you guys want. So I'm going to do my best to talk about everything that's going on with the company, why the stock has been crashing, why it's been soaring, uh, whether I think they can survive all of these issues that are going on, whether I think uh, they can stay financially afloat, or if I think they're headed for bankruptcy, all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about all of it. I'll share my opinion. And of course, I actually own a very small position in this stock myself. Uh, it's only about one to 2% of my portfolio, but I'll let you know everything that I've been doing, what I plan to do, and all that fun stuff. So I hope you guys enjoy the video. Please hit the like button if you do. But with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Ale. Welcome back to my world of stocks. Okay, we've got a lot to cover. So let's just pull up the stock chart and we'll take a look at everything that's going on and we'll kind of go from there. So like I mentioned before, in just the past four days, the stock has rallied by over 40%, which is obviously a gigantic amount as they were literally trading in the $7 range just days ago. And yet year to date, the stock is still down by over 76% after suffering one of the largest crashes that we've seen during this global issue and the stock market just kind of crashing in general. Now, as for me, I purchased a very small amount during the crash and then bought a lot more in the nine, eight and seven dollar ranges just to kind of lower my cost bases as much as possible, which I should be about break even now, but I'll throw up a screenshot when I'm editing the video later just to kind of show you. But uh, just to be clear though, this is nothing, absolutely nothing compared to how much more I bought in safer companies during the crash like Visa and of course big dividend payers like AT&T and PepsiCo as I discussed in several videos. But as it stands, CCL is still just less than 2% of my portfolio. So a very small position, but we'll talk more about it when I give my overall thoughts closer to the end of the video. Now, to give you some context, this is a stock that as recently as 2018 was trading at over $70 a share. And like I mentioned, they crashed all the way down to $7 only a few days ago. But as you can see on this decade long chart, this is a stock that normally trades much higher during a normal economic and kind of healthy environment without that global issue going around. Uh, but these last few months have uh, obviously been the complete opposite of all of that. Now, it's true that the stock was already trending downward off their highs before the sudden crash even happened, obviously to a much smaller degree, but it was mostly due to both global macroeconomic weakness, which Carnival is heavily exposed to as cruises are considered more of a leisurely expense, and also because of some really bad hurricane seasons, along with a cancellation of a new port in Cuba. And all of that led to quarterly profits eventually taking some hits. But I think what really spooked investors the most were the combination of those headwinds, along with the fact that the stock had simply climbed by too much. At one point, the P ratio had climbed to almost 18 and being that this was much more of a value kind of dividend stock rather than a growth stock, much more of a value stock, a P ratio of 18 was just too high and that helped the sell off gain some momentum. Now, fast forward to today though, and uh, the last time that I was able to get the P ratio on here, the sudden crash has left them with a trailing P ratio that plummeted all the way down to less than three, which is frankly incredible. Obviously that's a trailing P ratio though, using earnings for the past year because forward earnings are a completely different story and probably non-existent because of the shutdown and customer cancellations. Now the company itself has been halting a lot of cruises and in my opinion, I just can't imagine a lot of people uh, feeling confident enough to be taking cruises anytime sooner. And I'm not just talking about right now, 
I'm also talking about like summer or even fall, I think it's gonna be difficult to get those customers feeling confident again, given that global issue that's going around and even the lawsuits that Carnival has been facing themselves with some of the issues that they've had with their ships. I don't, I can't get too deep into that with, with YouTube because they flag videos for anything these days, but I think you guys kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Now, Carnival themselves, they have listed on their website official kind of cancellation dates and they only cancel these uh, cruises until like around sometime in mid May, which I think is way too optimistic. I think it's too soon. And my worry is that uh, whether Wall Street, whether the market is kind of pricing in those best kind of case scenarios, and maybe that's why the stock has also been taking off a little bit, because if that's the case, I think they're going to be severely disappointed. Again, anything can happen, and maybe we do see some pickup in cruises uh, later on in this year, but I, I just think May is way too soon. But let me just give you the official dates that they have listed on their website. Now, I believe this is just for the Carnival line, but they say that all ships will not sail until at least May 12th, although other cruises will be halted uh, further, like Alaska trips being canceled until at least July. San Francisco, which happens to be one of the hotspots right now for that global issue, is canceled for the entire year. But just so you know, San Francisco doesn't actually have any cruises to begin with because it's a new port that they were actually going to open up this year. So it's basically just like a delay on the new port. And then that's pretty much it because Carnival Radiance and Carnival Legend, I believe are just two specific ships on their own that are for longer kind of more expensive cruises. And I think the reason that they're not traveling until November is because that they're basically just being remodeled. In fact, Carnival Radiance has been upgraded from Carnival Victory for $200 million, but they had to suspend the upgrades because reportedly they couldn't get enough workers for it uh, due to that global issue going around. Anyway, the point is that we could actually see some cruises in the second half of this year. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing or that I even believe that they will stick to those dates. I'm just saying that that's what they're aiming for officially at the time of this recording. Now, I'm sure some people will throw caution to the wind and maybe jump on some of these cruises. And we're obviously seeing a lot of cheap prices out there. So maybe that does entice some people as well. But there's a couple of things to note here. Now, number one, uh, I was reading somewhere that about like a third of, of cruise passengers are over 55 years or, uh, or older. And I can't imagine that age group wanting to take a cruise at this time when you could easily just wait like another year or so and have a much safer uh, environment to be traveling and doing things like that. Now, I guess you could argue that prices will be more expensive by then, perhaps. Uh, but you also have to factor in the economic impact of this global issue that's going on. And with a lot of people talking about this being one of the deepest recessions that we've ever had, I'd have to imagine that people are not going to be wanting to spend money on vacations during such a difficult kind of macro environment. So put it all together and I just don't see a lot of passenger traffic happening this year. Next year could be a different story. I think we start to see a recovery, but this year, not so much. So I think no matter how you slice it, 2020 is going to be very ugly and disastrous for not just Carnival, but practically any other travel company out there. And so I think the question really becomes, can you survive this horrible environment that you're currently in with the global issue and with the macro economy issue? And can you make it out into next year and maybe ride some recovery there once things start getting back to normal and you start to see travel demand pick back up? Well, to answer that question, we do need to take a closer look at the financials to see if they can stay alive during this time period. So let's take a closer look at those financials right now. Okay, well, let me just get this out of the way. During any kind of normal economic environment, Carnival performs pretty well as they typically grow their sales by billions of dollars a year, while also generating billions of dollars in profits as well, although those have been shaky at times. But last year alone, they did about $3 billion of net income on over $20 billion in sales. Of course, this year will be a completely different story as most analysts out there are talking about zero revenue scenarios for possibly multiple quarters, depending on how everything plays out. Now for the year, we know that it can't technically be a zero revenue year because they already reported Q1, which which ran through the end of February and sales were actually up slightly year over year, surprisingly at close to $5 billion, although they still lost close to $800 million on their bottom line due to a goodwill impairment charge of almost a billion dollars since 
their brand is obviously taking a huge hit right now, but it, it just basically means that the strength of their assets and their brand are no longer as strong as they used to think it was because of that global issue. But uh, again, because that <laughs> global issue, I'm getting sick of saying that, but because of that global issue didn't really start to ramp up until March in many places, Q1 wasn't a total disaster because again, it, it only lasted until the end of February. Uh, but Q2 and Q3 though, in my opinion, I, I think will be horrendous. And that's where you can really start to think about zero revenue scenarios. Now, as far as guidance goes, they said that it's too difficult to predict how much money they will lose this year, but they did say that net income will for sure be negative, which I obviously do agree with since they're estimating that they will need around a billion dollars of raw cash per month just to get by during the shutdown. And even if things start opening up slowly, I'd imagine that the cash burn would continue for a while into next year, even, even uh, then. Now, because of that, they've implemented several different initiatives. For one, the dividend is cut. So if you're a dividend investor, you can kiss that dividend goodbye. The reason I actually started watching Carnival in the first place myself was because of their very attractive dividend. But as I noted in previous videos, if things were to get worse, they would probably have to cut it just like they did in the last recession. So this really wasn't a big surprise kind of move to me at all because they have been willing to cut it in the past. And given how much cash they will need to likely burn through and how much debt they will be taking on, I wouldn't hold your breath on when that dividend comes back. It could definitely be a while even if they survive and start to recover. But speaking of debt, in order to raise money, they sold both stock and bonds in order to raise around $6 billion of liquidity. Of course, the stock offerings will dilute shareholders while the bond offerings offer huge interest rates. I think it was like 11.5% huge interest rates and are even convertible into regular stock, which would dilute shareholders even further. And they're not even at great prices as I believe the stock sales were as low as $8 a share and the bonds can later convert for as little as $10 a share. Both are very scary figures to look at considering that the stock was trading for over $70 a share just a couple years ago and over $50 uh, a share just a few months ago. Meanwhile, the bonds are also guaranteed by collateral of much of Carnival's assets. In other words, if they go bankrupt, many of their ships and other assets like, I don't know, say like casino equipment, like different things on their ships would actually go to the debt holders, uh, the people that they basically sold those bonds to, uh, as opposed to like any of us kind of like common shareholders. Although I wouldn't have expected to receive anything anyway if they were to go bankrupt, but it's just kind of something to note. Now, all of that funding though is in addition to the already nearly $12 billion that they had of liquidity at the beginning of March. So if you add it all up, uh, you're talking about somewhere around $18 billion or so of liquidity. Obviously you're gonna be dealing with a lot of debts, but Debt is not really what you, I mean, it's it's definitely important, but you like what's more important is liquidity because you just wanna stay alive at this point. So, but anyway, even if you factor in a billion dollars per month that they need to burn through just to kind of stay alive, and then I guess you add some more maybe to service that new debt, which again is gonna be very high debt, uh, they should probably be able to last through at least a year or more in my personal opinion. even if they're not selling any tickets or generating any kind of cash flow. In fact, UBS did a stress test on each of the big three cruise liners, uh, Carnival, Royal, and Norwegian, and determined that with all of the recent moves given a zero revenue environment, so basically assuming that there are no new cruises and there's just no money coming in at all from any sales, uh, Norwegian can last around seven to eight months, Royal can last around 10 months and Carnival can last the most at around 12 to 13 months, possibly even 15 months, depending on other factors. And they're not the only ones saying that. Another analyst, this time a leisure analyst from Instanet, uh, said that they are unlikely to go bankrupt even if cruising doesn't resume for many months with a near zero revenue environment all the way into the first quarter of 2021. And while I know that cruise lines were completely left out of the US stimulus package because they're essentially foreign cor corporations that don't pay very much in US taxes. For, for example, Carnival is actually registered in Panama, but if things were to get so bad to the point where they need a bailout like at all costs, they could theoretically register in the US and receive those loans that they need as Trump has kind of hinted to in the past. So I'm just kind of looking at all of it and I'm just thinking, they're kind of, they're, they're pretty much likely to survive here. I don't really think that they're gonna be going bankrupt. Now, as far as why the stock shot up in recent days, 
It's been carried along by some of those positive reports of liquidity, obviously, but the real surge actually started when reports came out that the Saudi Arabia Wealth Fund, which is famous for investing in companies like Uber and Tesla, and currently manages over $300 billion of assets, had decided to invest in Carnival, taking up more than an 8% stake in the company. I don't know what price they paid, but according to the SEC website, it's around 43.5 million shares, which is obviously a lot. On top of that, Business Insider notes that an un named Carnival director also purchased another $10 million in the most recent offering. Now, I don't normally pay too much attention to who's buying stocks because they can literally sell at any moment and then it all becomes meaningless, but it's just something that I think is kind of interesting to note nonetheless. Either way though, until I see otherwise, I have to assume that the cruise line industry will eventually recover over the long term. Before all of this happened, it was a cash generating machine thanks to a growing middle class that had reached over 50% of the world's population. And according to the 2019 cruise industry report from the Cruise Line International Association, which may maybe is a little biased, but uh, I tend to kind of believe them, uh, we were seeing an increase of millions of new passengers every year with a projected 30 million last year alone, leading to an economic output of over $130 billion worldwide. So it's a pretty big market. Uh, so if Carnival can just stay alive long enough for things to return back to normal and for travel demand to pick back up, there's a large industry there for them to continue tapping into as they have by far the, the most market share with more than double the number of passengers than their next closest competitor in 2018 and a massive fleet of over 100 ships visiting over 700 ports around the world. So a really gigantic uh, uh, cruise company, basically the biggest. And that seems to be the plan as Carnival is trying desperately to keep passengers from canceling trips and instead delay them to a later time and receive some perks in return. For example, their Seaborne line offers a 125% credit for a future cruise taken anytime next year if you choose that over a standard refund. And I've been seeing a lot of their kind of brands offering similar things. Now, some of these moves might actually be working as Business Insider points out that they had nearly $5 billion in customer deposits at the end of February. And in the first two weeks of March, nearly half of the customers that called the company to cancel cruises actually opted for the bonus credits to take a cruise at a later date. Of course, it's still horrible when you're losing like more than half of your customers, but it's still better than nothing. It's better than losing all of them. And again, these are just really horrible times that they're trying to survive, trying to get through. So they're just trying to maintain, they're trying to keep as many of their customers as possible. But that's really the scary thing of all this is that you're not just investing in a stock here, you're investing in the idea that this global issue and the macro economy both get under control and we start to see a recovery and things getting back to normal basically within a year. I mean, when you look at those cancellation dates, uh, Carnival looking to open things back up by mid-May, maybe summer, things like that, you're talking about things getting under control very soon. And what I worry about is that the market, because the market itself has been climbing, so I worry that the market itself, and then this individual stock itself too, and travel stocks, that some of the best case scenarios are being priced into some of these stocks, when in reality, we might be setting ourselves ourselves up for some disappointment. And so for those reasons, I have to consider a stock like this to be very risky, very volatile, very speculative in the sense that we could be running into some zero revenue kind of uh, situations here, at least for maybe a quarter or two, maybe a couple quarters. And what I don't like about that is I don't consider that an investment. I don't, I don't want to be investing in a stock where I have to ask myself the question, hey, can this company survive a zero revenue environment? I mean, what other stock do you ask yourself that question with? When I look at some of my largest investments like Microsoft and Amazon, do I have to ask myself, hey, can they survive a zero revenue scenario? And by the way, they can, because they have tons of liquidity, tons of money. Microsoft, one of the best balance sheets in the entire world. It's one of the reasons why those are my core holdings. Uh, but I don't like to have to be thinking about those type of things because, uh, but that's, that's what you have to deal with with travel stocks because we've learned something here. We've learned that these travel stocks are so incredibly vulnerable to those type of global issues. And apparently those type of global issues can just kind of come in out of nowhere and collapse our entire economy. I mean, force us to shut everything down and those ones take the biggest hits and they're at risk of going bankrupt you know, almost at any moment in some ways, okay? So the way I see it, it's not really an investable 
company for me. And when I first was attracted to Carnival, I used to think of it as an investable company and an investable stock. I no longer really feel that way. Now I look at it as more of a spec place. So I'm going into it with the mentality or, or I'm holding it with the mentality of, okay, this stock can potentially just go to zero and I lose all of my money in it, or it could take off and maybe I make a nice profit and it gets back to its normal levels. Now, Again, I do think that things will get back to normal and I do think that Carnival will survive. So that's why I continue to hold it, but it's a spec stock. I have to be realistic about it. And I also have to be realistic about the uh, market conditions that we're going through right now. There's gonna continue to be tons of volatility. So this is a stock that if you were investing in a, in a stock like this, you have to be understanding of the fact that Tomorrow, the stock could be down 20%. The next day, it could be up 10%. Next day, it could be down 30. Next day, it could be up 40. This is an incredibly volatile stock. And if you can't handle that type of volatility, I don't think you should be touching anything like this. Because again, it's not like one of those safe kind of long-term investments. It's a spec play. So if you can't handle spec plays, you really shouldn't be touching it. And I don't like to invest in spec plays, by the way. So maybe I actually end up selling this stock. You know, Now that I'm kind of breaking even on it, maybe I do end up selling it. I can't tell you for sure, but at the moment, I would prefer to hold it. As of recording this video, I would prefer to just kind of hold it as a spec play and see what happens in the future. Maybe I'll make a, make a nice little profit on it, only because it's such a small position. If this was a large position, I would be trimming it way down. But because it's only one to 2%, less than 2% of my portfolio, I'm okay with it being a spec play. If I was to lose that money, I wouldn't lose sleep. I, I'd definitely be upset, but I wouldn't you know, go crazy over it. And uh, if it were to return to healthier, to, to prior, levels before all of this happened, then maybe I make a nice little profit on it. And, uh, and, and I would obviously be happy about that. Anyway, those are just my thoughts, guys. I hope that you could understand the video and it was enjoyable. I know I was probably all over the place because I have such conflicting thoughts and so many different viewpoints on a stock like this, which is natural it's to be expected. But I hope that you enjoyed the video. Uh, let me know what you think down below. For me personally, probably a long-term spec play that I'll just continue to hold but we'll kind of have to see what happens. But let me know if you guys would like updates and also let me know what other stock you want me to be reviewing next. I've had a lot of people ask me to do Delta, so maybe you guys would like to see that one. Let me know down below or if there's any other one as well. Uh, and let me know what you're doing with this stock, if you own it, if you're staying away. And I don't blame you for either one. If you were to buy it, if you were to stay away, completely understand both, uh, both viewpoints. But uh, anyway, thanks again for watching. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. But most of all, take care, stay safe out there, guys, with everything going on, and uh, I wish you all the best. But anyway, thanks again, take care, bye-bye.